and turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And uh, didn't you enjoy that trumpet special? And I uh, enjoyed that. I'm so thankful that Joseph could be with us uh, this week and Jonathan. And after this week, they're going to college. So this is uh, bittersweet for us, that is for sure. Wow, you got a good truckload of kids tonight, so they'll enjoy the kids' club. All the children may be dismissed at this time. All the kids can be dismissed uh, for their kids' club time, and they'll enjoy that very much so. And take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 16. As you're turning there and find your place, let me uh, first of all just say thank you so much to Pastor uh, for the invitation again, and I really do appreciate that. Um, usually we get some type of fishing or some extracurricular activity in, this time he fixed our appliance, <laughs> our uh, dryer in our, our, our uh, trailer, so we're very, very thankful to have a washer and dryer that works, and uh, I'm grateful for that very much, so that was really an answer to prayer, so it's been a, been a tr tremendous help. Uh, thank you so much as well. So many have been so kind to us throughout the week, uh, just uh, voicing how the messages have been encouragement or what the Lord's been doing in your heart, even outside of these services, and how God's been growing you, and that's an encouragement to hear on our, our behalf, and thank you so much for your giving as well, and uh, we are always thrilled with the generosity of God's people, and uh, you, you know, throughout the years of 27 years now in, in ministry, uh, we just, uh, it's just amazed how the Lord provides as we go by faith to different places, and uh, through God's people and giving, and uh, we're thrilled about that. Would you pray for us as we head on? Uh, we are going to uh, Tennessee, and then we fly to Florida. That sounds like it makes sense, doesn't it? And uh, so we actually fly down to Tampa, and because of where we're going next, and dropping the kids off for college, and it's just it's less expensive for us to actually fly it to people. It's amazing uh, with all of this and the timing. So uh, we're going up to, <laughs> to go back down, and then uh, we go onward and upward. Um, let me mention a couple items on the table, and then I'll mention uh, more specifically how you can pray and connect with our ministry. Uh, first of all, uh, there's some materials back there that can be a help to you. First is a small pamphlet called Winning Our Loved Ones. Uh, how do you give the gospel to those that are perhaps the closest to you, family members and such, and maintain that relationship? Um, and it's a challenge, and I remember giving the gospel to someone that was, I was related to by marriage, and a very burdened, but I really, I wish I would have read this first. And uh, the Lord worked in spite of myself. It was one of those things, the power of the gospel. Uh, but uh, I wish I would have had the, the insight and the help from that pamphlet. Uh, then another one on the matter of soul winning is just an easy read, but so encouraging. This is one of those books I was wanting to get um, and uh, reprint it. And I was going to, I called the ministry that had the, held the, um, the, the rights to it, and they wouldn't let it go, wouldn't let it go. Finally, uh, another ministry got it, and, uh, and they got it reprinted, so I'm so thrilled about it. It's called Just What the Doctor Ordered, and it's by Walter Wilson. He was a, a, a doctor, MD. He did preach, uh, but that wasn't his main calling. He was a doctor, uh, but he got a hold of the Spirit-filled life and the truths we've been talking about this week, and it's incredible about the divine opportunities and appointments that God just put right in his path because he was yielded to the Spirit and uh, he was used of the Lord to be able to see people saved. Uh, let me encourage you uh, uh, when we, um, as far as giving out the gospel, again, to possibly get some of the QR cards. This is the uh, 50 pack, and there's a slide that talks just a little bit about that. Uh, on one side, you'll see on the slide uh, the present, and the other side is just some uh, ways to be able to get to the website if they can't scan it for some reason, but it, it gives a gospel presentation, and so I want to encourage you with that. Uh, as we mentioned earlier in the week, the Lord's given us opportunity not only to local, have local church ministries and uh, meetings like this one, but also to have crusades. And there's two aspects of our ministry, and we have the Faith for Revival and also the Hope for America. And the slide should show that as well. And so there, we actually do have two websites uh, for both. Uh, but I encourage you to look us up and be able to connect with us in, in that way as we move forward. We have our next crusade for Hope for America rally and crusade in Rockford, Illinois, and that's the end of September. And there's about 10 churches coming together, and we rent um, a portion of the fairgrounds. It's the second largest fairgrounds in the state, and uh, we're just expecting anywhere from about 700 to 800 people uh, in a nightly attendance Sunday through a Sunday. So isn't that unique? 
So uh, we've seen God work in amazing ways. In Pennsylvania, it was our first one. We did it in 2020 uh, in the midst of all of COVID and everything else. And God bless. It was just incredible. It's supernatural. And we had 50 some people trust Jesus Christ as Savior. We had a second one just earlier this spring in Morgan County, Indiana, uh, south of Indianapolis. And we had 40, uh, about 44, 45 people trust Jesus Christ as Savior as well. And so we're praying that the Lord would use us in a great way. Would you pray for us? Um, these are huge endeavors. We always have opposition. We always have spiritual roadblocks. And Satan has not been quiet on this one. Uh, there's been a lot of attacks on churches and different ones uh, as we've gone forward with these crusades, but each pastor is, is convinced and by faith that we should go forward, and uh, we're thrilled about that, and we're asking for prayer, so we we'd encourage you with that. Uh, so one of the best ways to keep in contact with us is to get on our email list. Uh, I try to do every month, but I don't always do every month, but I'm not one that's going to bombard you with emails. Uh, but if you like to get on our, our list, uh, we try to do uh, once a month or so, uh, when that's a good way. We also have some YouTube channels as well, so I encourage you to just get connected in that way. And if you'd like to sign up for the email, uh, we can help you at the end, uh, at the back there. Just do it right into our computer, and it'll sign you up right away, and that will make it easy for you. You have Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16. Um, and if you would stand out of respect of God's word as we read verses 6 to verse 10, Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10. Thank you so much for uh, holding through all those announcements. I appreciate that. Acts chapter 16, look at verse 6. The Bible says this. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Did you catch that? Forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia? Why is that? Well, we're going to find out. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed, or they tried, if you will, to, to go to Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And as a vision appeared to Paul in the, in the night, there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. The title of the message tonight is How to Be at the Right Place at the Right Time. How to Be at the Right Place at the Right Time. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you so much for bringing us in tonight. Thank you for helping us throughout this week to understand your word. I pray you do the same tonight. Lord, fill me with your spirit. I pray that it help me to preach clearly exactly what you'd want. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I was invited to come to a church uh, for a special Sunday. It was a big friend day, uh, and it was really a, a pretty good day. Uh, the Lord blessed in some ways. We didn't have anyone saved. There were some uh, that did attend and such. It was an okay, I guess, if you will, service is nothing spectacular. We were getting in our truck uh, on Monday, and we are getting ready to leave. And it was a really tight turn, and I had my windows down, and I heard clang from the trailer. And I said, okay, put it in reverse, and I backed it up. My wife said, why are you doing that? I said, we just broke a leaf spring. She said, how do you know? I know. <laughs> and as I looked back, sure enough, we broke a leaf spring. We're stuck there and for now several days. Well, during that time frame, the pastor said, well, you're going to be here throughout the week. Why don't you preach for us on Wednesday? You know, Wednesday is, this is Wednesday. Uh, thankfully, on that particular occasion, you didn't have to use a boat to get to church, uh, but, uh, but we preached on Wednesday. And so when we got there, it was just a different service. I said, God, if, if you have us here on purpose and for this reason, Lord, would you just fulfill that on this service? It was more exciting than the Sunday service. And it was a Wednesday midweek service. In fact, um, we had some life-changing decisions. There's a couple there that, that night that were on the brink of losing their marriage. And they said that message was the turning point for them, and they still are married now because of that. They wrote me a big, long letter uh, explaining this. Some others made some life-changing decisions on a Wednesday night 
But not only that, there was a Chinese exchange student there that night. He was supposed to come. He was invited for the friend day, but he came on the wrong day. He thought it was Wednesday instead of Sunday. So he showed up on the Wednesday. And in that message, I also presented the gospel. And afterwards, I talked to him. He said, yeah, I, I need that. I know <laughs> I do now recognize there is a God, and I do need to be saved. And I walked him through the gospel, and he trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. And it was just obvious that God put me at the right place at the right time. As we're leaving, he sees the missionary board and he says, what are all these pictures and these places and on the map? And I said, well, these people uh, are going to locations in different countries to tell you, to tell them what I told you tonight. They're called missionaries and uh, that, that's what they're going to do. And he looked and he said, well, where's the one to China? <laughs> I said, there isn't one. He said, well, maybe I could be the next. <laughs> and it was an incredible Incredible experience. Now, I didn't plan that. It wasn't in my plans, but it certainly was in God's. You see, we need to trust God when he changes our plans to be able to match his divine appointments. Because God's plans are better than our original plans. God can navigate and change things. Maybe God is changing some things throughout your life, your day, or just your week, whatever the case is, and instead of reacting in the wrong way, would you begin to understand perhaps God has a bitter, bigger and better plan for me so I could be at the right place at the right time? Will you recognize God's greatness and, and certainly uh, his ability to providentially change things? And as we do so, would you respond in these three ways? How, how can we be at the right place at the right time? Number one, don't disobey when the Holy Spirit tells you no. Number one, do not disobey when the Holy Spirit tells you no. Now, here are the men in Acts chapter 16, and Paul and Silas, and they're wanting to go. What are they trying to do? Disobey God? Trying to be rebel, rebellious? Trying to live on their own party? No, no, no. They're going to go preach the gospel. But look at what the Holy Spirit does. Verse 6, the Bible says this. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia, in the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. You would think with a, such a strong word, forbidden of the Holy Ghost to murder this person. <laughs> forbidden of the Holy Ghost to, to do that heinous crime. No. To preach the word in Asia. Now, is it wrong to preach your word? Obviously not. Is it wrong to preach a word in Asia? It is not. But it was wrong for Paul and Silas to preach the word in Asia at that time and at that place right then. You see, God had something better. What if they said, no, <laughs> I'm just going to go. I'm going to preach a word no matter what. <laughs> They'd be disobeying God because he has another place. We talked about uh, grieving the Holy Spirit last night what about not quenching the spirit not quenching the spirit quenching the spirit is when the holy spirit's doing a work or he's he's maybe starting that fire of revival in your heart and your life and he's he's starting to do something and he's guiding you and he's directing you, you said no 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 don't go there and i want to come over here you know what <laughs> god's no is not negative God saying, no, don't do this, is not negative, but it's to direct and guide your path to have the best thing for you. And so as we continue to go down the path and God tells us, no, the Holy Spirit says, no, don't do that. I want you to go over here. Each time what we're doing is quenching the Holy Spirit. It's like building a fire at a campsite and then taking a bucket of water and pouring it on it. Every time you try to light the fire, then you, someone pours a bucket of water. You say, look, would you stop? I'm trying to build a campfire here for us. I can't keep doing that if you keep quenching the fire. The Holy Spirit is not going to continue his work, and it's not, you're not going to feel the effect of it if you qu keep quenching him each time he tells you, no, don't do this thing. So don't resist him. Don't quench him in that way. But just as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 just trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. 
the idea of direct your path is to cut a path. It's kind of like here's this huge aisle. You know, going through the woods, sometimes it's uncertain. You don't know, am I, am I over here? Am I over here? Which path do I go? But I like it when there's a clear path you can follow and you're hiking and it's obvious. I'm just going to go on this clear path. That is the same uh, Hebrew word and the same meaning when it talked about the prophecy of John the Baptist and one's going before the Lord saying, clear the way, make a highway. Not just a path, how about a highway that God is going to clear for you? You want to know God's will? You want to know what you should do next? Then don't say no to the Holy Spirit when you don't understand. Trust Him and don't quench the Spirit of God. But as we're trusting the Spirit, we're doing it when we don't understand this thing. We're not certain about it. Look at verse 7. It says, after they were uh, come to Mysia, they essayed or they uh, you know, attempted to go to Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. That means he did not allow them. No, 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 no. Forbid it. Don't go to Asia. Okay. Oh, how about if we go over here to Bithynia uh, and this area? The Spirit said, I, I'm, I'm not going to allow you. This, again, is very strong language. But why? Because the Spirit has a path right here. I want you to follow this one. Are you on the path of God's will, listening to the Spirit, trusting Him, obeying Him, or just going by your senses? Well, I want to. <laughs> well, what does God want you to do? Well, I think I should. I understand. You're using your senses, aren't you? Why don't you trust God and his spirit as he's beginning to lead you and guide you? What is he doing? He's going to make a clear path. When you don't understand, just trust him. So God then uh, has the Macedonia vision in verses 9 and 10 for Paul. It's very clear. He says, come over and help us. Now look at verse 10. I love this. It says, and after he had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us. I, I underline that, assuredly gathering. I want it to be clear that what I'm doing is in God's will. God's directing me in this way. And so here they are. I don't understand, but okay, we're going to this area to preach the gospel here. What happens next? Notice as well that they obeyed immediately. Um, when, when the Spirit tells you no, does he have to tell you no again? and again and again, or are you sensitive to obey, sensitive to the Spirit's voice? Uh, being at the Bill Rice Ranch in the summertime, the Christian camp for young people, they do have horses, they have 40 head of horses, and I've seen some horses that don't obey the first time. <laughs> I've ridden those horses, you know, you pull them over here and they're not, they don't want to go over here, they want to go on their own path. Uh, you try to get them to go faster, and they're not going faster, and they're holding back, or whatever the case is, or they're stopping to eat grass over here. Man, it's so hard to get them just to do what they're supposed to do. But then I've seen the cowboy, the head cowboy, just drop the reins. And on a fully broken horse, a well-trained horse, he says, walk. And with his voice command, the horse begins to walk. He can lay grain and, and lean, and he can get them go in and out, cones and these different things. And he says, whoa, and the horse will stop. He can do all of that. Why? Because the, spirit, I mean, because the horse is so sensitive to the voice of the master. Are we that sensitive? As they were immediate obedient, now look if you would in the next few verses. Uh, it says uh, they went to Philippi in verse 12. They came thence to Philippi, uh, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia. In verse 13, and on the Sabbath we went out to the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the woman which, uh, women which resorted thither. Verse 14, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worship God heard us, watch this, I underline this phrase, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And she was baptized in her household. And she besought us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Okay, so here now they providentially meet Lydia, that they would not have met if they would have gone to Asia. Or they would not have met if they'd gone over to Bithynia. But now here they are coming to Macedonia. They're coming to Philippi. And as they're doing so, they meet 
uh, Lydia, and who opened her heart? It wasn't Paul. It wasn't Silas. It was the Lord. And she was baptized. Okay, now she went to worship God. I believe this. Here she is. She's a Gentile. And she is one that believes in God, recognizes there's a God. I need to worship him. But she probably didn't know Jesus was the Messiah. She probably wasn't placing her faith in true trust of trusting uh, Christ as her Savior. But when she heard the message, her heart was open. She was baptized as a result of that because of her faith. And God worked in a great way. Look, don't disobey when the Spirit says no. Because God's no is not negative. It's there to direct your path. Number two, if we're going to be at the right place at the right time, don't trust your feelings. Don't trust your feelings. Look at, skip down to verse 20. Skip down to verse 20. Here's Paul and Silas. They, uh, they preach in Philippi. Long story short, they meet another girl. This other uh, girl here, uh, she is demon-possessed. She keeps following them, and uh, they cast out the demon. She, I believe she is saved, and uh, she's not making money now for her masters. She's not enslaved any longer. Look at verse 20. It says, It brought them to the magistrates, Paul and Silas, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them in the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas said, Why in the world are we here? <laughs> no. Here is Paul and Silas. Did they obey God? You can go ahead and say it, yes or no. Yes or no. Okay, there's two people. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> did Paul and Silas obey the Holy Spirit? Yes. Okay, yes, they did. Okay. So were they right place at the right time? Yes. Okay. Did it feel like it? <laughs> uh, felt like they got beaten for something they didn't deserve. They were doing what was right, preaching the gospel. You know what? You're not always going to be treated properly. So even if you're doing what is right, don't expect those around you to always pat you on the back. Here they were beaten on the back, and they were resisted because of what they did. They were imprisoned because of preaching the gospel. Don't expect even other believers to always say, okay, you're serving the Lord, you're doing this, okay, that's wonderful. You just need to say, okay, I'm not going to base it upon my feelings because right now it sure doesn't feel after being beaten. They're cast in the most inner part of the prison. Their feet are in the stocks. They cannot walk around. The, you know the inner part is going to be dark. It's going to be musty. It's going to stink and reek terribly. Uh, no doubt the facilities, if they would be loud out at all, you just let your imagination go wild there. It's just going to be an absolutely terrible, uh, terrible experience. And so they didn't, though, trust their feelings, but we see the result of being filled with the Spirit. You know, we heard about that joy in serving Jesus. <laughs> joy doesn't come from your circumstances. It doesn't come when everybody's like, oh, that's great. That's a wonderful message, Brother Chris. <laughs> You know, there's times I'm like, wow, this is a terrible thing or this is a terrible experience, but God worked in spite of myself. Don't trust your feelings. Specifically, two aspects. Number one, don't allow your feelings of fear to replace your faith. Don't allow your feelings of fear to replace your faith. Now, they could be in the prison. They're going, man, this is terrible. What's going to happen next? They're going to keep us here. Uh, we're never going to get out. Uh, we're not going to see uh, any of our friends or family again. Uh, this is, this, we're going to probably die here. They're going to probably put us to death. No, they didn't do that. They were not full of fear, but they were full of faith. But secondly, don't allow your feelings of resentment to steal your joy. Don't allow your feelings of resentment to steal your joy. Look at verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, that's the faith, and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. <laughs> now, typically, what they're doing is they are 
Um, now, they're, they're singing, but, you know, typically the other pe prisoners are hearing cussing and cursing and terrible things, saying, I shouldn't be here. That's not what Paul and Silas did. They sang, sang praises unto God, filled with the Spirit, and they were full of joy. We can see in Acts chapter 13 and verses 51 and 52. You want to turn there? Acts chapter 13, verse 51 the Bible says this, Acts chapter 13, verse 51. After being thrown out of a particular city, Paul and Barnabas, it says this in verse 51 of Acts 13, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. You see, I believe Paul and Silas in the prison had joy because they were full of the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that joy cannot be stolen. You have to give it up. Because you have to, at some point, stop allowing the Holy Spirit to fill you and supernaturally overcome your circumstances to have that joy that cannot be stolen by those things that are going around you. Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13, they were, they were thrown out of the city for what? For preaching the gospel. They didn't curse them. They weren't mad at them. They were full of joy. And they left going on to the next place. Look, don't let your feeling of resentment hold you back. Now, if anybody could have complained, should have complained, it would have been Paul and Silas, right? Are you complaining because of your circumstances? No, no, no. I'm just, uh, I'm just giving, um, uh, I'm just giving, uh, you know, constructive criticism. <laughs> they at the church should do this. You know, they at the church should change that. Why don't you say we at the church and I'd be happy to help and volunteer and serve because you're a part of the body. You're a part of this as well. You know, I've learned this. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, you want, you want to turn there? Let's turn there just real quickly. Ephesians chapter 5. We're not going to turn to a lot of other passages, so this will be good for us to see. Ephesians chapter 5, find verse 18. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine, where it is excess but be filled with the Spirit. Now, we're going to keep going. Ephesians 5.18, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Why were they singing? Because they were filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, you notice there's no period. The resulting influence of being filled with the Spirit of verse 18 continues to verse 19. There's no period. It continues to verse 20. There's no period. It continues all the way down to verse 21. There's finally the period. All the times where it says anywhere the ending in ing, speaking in verse 19, in your in Psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. All of those are a result of being filled with the Spirit. Now let me let me ask when bad things are happening to you, is there a song? <laughs> Or is there, oh man, this is terrible. Are you giving praise to God supernaturally? Look, you and I can't do that on our own. We have to be filled with the Spirit to do that and to overcome our circumstances. Look at verse 21, Ephesians 5, 21. Submitting yourselves one to another. I'm sorry, verse 20. I skipped verse 20. Ephesians 5, 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you realize what it said there? Giving thanks when? Always. For how many things? For all things. I call that impossible things. You can't do that, and I certainly cannot do that on my own. Uh, I didn't realize how much of a complainer I was until I got married. My wife helped me. She said, you know you're complaining. No, 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 that's, um, no, it's, no, it's complaining. <laughs> it's complaining. And then I learned this. You can't complain and be filled with the Spirit at the same time. You cannot complain and be filled with the Spirit at the same time. Yes, someone pulled in front of you. Yes, perhaps you got in a small bumper, the bumper accident. Or your car won't start. Or it's raining again. I think we're going to put just in, you know, some type of, we're going to convert our RV into a boat so we can actually leave tomorrow. And, uh, you know, what, what if we're complaining about the weather or complaining about our job or complaining about this or that? Complaining is saying anything in a negative or derogatory manner where the person to whom you speak can do nothing about. They can't change it. I go, hey, Brother Dan, what's the deal with the rain? You know, what's, what, aren't you praying for sunshine? <laughs> you know, I can't go to Brother Dan and blame him. No, uh, no, I can't do that. So 
he can't do anything about it. If I said, man, why does it have to be like this? Or why does it have to be like that? Or why is this happening? Or rah, 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 rah. You know, complaining doesn't help the person you're speaking to. It pulls them down as well if they listen to your negative spirit. And let me tell you, you're not filled with the spirit when you do so. Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas, they were filled with song. They were filled with joy supernaturally because they were filled with the spirit. Don't say no to the spirit. Don't trust your feelings. Back in Acts chapter 16, you know, here they could have been in such a resentful way. The resentment could have stolen the joy. Hey, we didn't deserve this. We've been mistreated. Now let me ask, has anybody mistreated you? Yeah. Has anybody that perhaps even has been a Christian or um, religious mistreated you? Well, certainly. But look, my present is not dictated by my past of how someone mistreated me in my past. I'm going to move forward, and I'm not going to view God through my filter of resentment of how someone treated me in the past. You need to say, dear God, would you help me to forgive so I can get over this? Stop being critical. Stop being condescending to other people that perhaps are different than you or have treated you differently. And you're seeing it, you're thinking, I'm justified in this way. No, you're not because your resentment is holding you back from being full of the Holy Spirit and be free from that to have joy. You're not hurting the other person. You're hurting yourself. So don't trust your feelings. You want to be at the right place at the right time? Don't say no to the Holy Spirit. Number two, don't trust your feelings. Number three, don't miss God's divine opportunity. Don't miss God's divine opportunity. God's opportunities and appointments are divine and they're providential and he has them all the time and I believe they're available for us but oftentimes we miss them how can we miss them by not obeying and not trusting let's look at the passage Acts chapter 16 as we continue the story uh, there is an earthquake because they're uh, after midnight after they're praying and such and the, all the doors were open um, of course, the, uh, the Philippian jailer came out. He was going to kill himself in verse 27, supposing that the prisoners had fled. They said, don't do yourself any harm. Verse 29, then called for a light. He sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Acts chapter 16, verse 30, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, all, and all his, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into the house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. How is it that Paul and Silas got to meet this Philippian jailer, see his whole family trust Jesus Christ as Savior? It's because way back here, when the Holy Spirit said, no, don't go over here. I forbid you to go to Asia. I don't, I'm not going to suffer you to go here. I have another path for you right here. They did not say no to the Holy Spirit. They didn't disobey. They continued to obey. And now here's the opportunity when it comes to giving the gospel. And they didn't shrink back in disobedience. They didn't shrink back in selfishness and resentment and self-pity party and self-focus. I remember I was heading down to Florida one particular time we, in our truck and trailer, and, and we need propane for several things with the trailer and such. And uh, it was cold, actually. It was uh, going to be a cold time in uh, Florida, and so it was going to drop down to the 30s. And so uh, we stopped to get propane. In the first place, uh, it's like they, they didn't have a worker to be able to do it or whatever the case was. They didn't have anybody. And so I said, okay, I stopped at the second place. Same type of thing. We were out where I think it was maybe they were out of propane. I stop at a third place. I'm going, this is crazy. Third place. Oh, yeah, we've got it, and we've got a worker. Oh, but he left, and, uh, and he didn't give the key to the next guy in the shift. Um, if you wait 10 minutes, he'll probably be here. 30 minutes later, he's still not there. And I am just complaining. I am just fuming. I'm going, man, what in the world? Is there a propane shortage in America? You know, <laughs> and I'm... <clears throat> I'm just focused on self this whole time. And I go, 
Maybe there's a reason for this, and I'm missing it. Now, one time that I give out a tract to any of the people. Now, one time that I try to engage in a gospel conversation. And I'm sitting there like 30 minutes, 40 minutes or whatever, waiting for this guy to show up, and I finally go, God, help me and forgive me. I got a track, I went in, I handed a couple out. I still had to leave without propane. <laughs> but not only did I think I missed the propane, I, I think I missed what God was doing because I was just so self-focused and disobedient. You know, maybe the rearranging of your schedule might be a little uncomfortable, but it, perhaps it's for someone's eternal value and eternal destiny. And you missed it. I sure did. I don't even know because I was so self-focused and disobedient. Not only don't disobey, but obviously you can miss it by not obeying, by, by not trusting. Not trusting. Just trust the Lord. Now, this Philippian jailer, I, I just I wonder, was he just so quick to draw out his sword? Or maybe... He had thought about this scenario before. I've got prisoners. If they escape, I'll be killed. I'll be executed. Maybe it's a long, drawn-out thing. I'm good. I'm just, when that thing, when that play, the, if that scenario takes place, I'm taking my life. You know what? Because I hate my job anyway. <laughs> I'm a jailer. Um, pay's terrible. Family's not doing well. I might as well just end it anyway. I don't know what he's thinking. But let me tell you, he wasn't full of purpose, was he? And he sure didn't know where he was going to go when he was going to die because he asked, what must I do to be saved? God is wanting to lead you. Would you trust you, trust the Lord to lead you to other people that are ready to hear the gospel? I was preaching <clears throat> in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and as I was doing so, we're asking the Lord to give us divine appointments and such that week. And we had a special... Um, uh, service where we're inviting friends and ones did come in but uh, I'm preaching the service is already going I'm like halfway through my message and someone comes through the back door and they sit down at the back lady redhead and in my message I already had it planned it wasn't this one it was a different one but I had it planned and I said <clears throat> you're not here by accident God has you here on purpose and as soon as I said that she looked up at me she had big eyes man she's just glued now and I went through that God wanted to hear, wants you to hear the gospel and the good news, how you could be saved and on your way to heaven. And uh, I gave the invitation. She came out along with some others. She came and she met the assistant pastor, and he and his wife led her to Christ. Afterwards, I said, who invited you? She said, nobody did. I've been driving by this church for months, and I thought, I've got to stop there sometime. I know I need God in my life. But every time I'm driving by, they're never here or I'm not available to come on Sundays. But it was a Friday night. And we went and had the meetings all the way through Friday night. And she's like, there's nobody. There's never someone here on Friday night. When I saw the cars, I knew I needed to come in. And then you said you're not here by accident. <laughs> and God was just doing this. And she was just gloriously saved. You know what? God can do that so many times over. So many um, will, can trust Jesus Christ the Savior if you just trust him. God can do that work time and time again. I remember um, opportunities of divine appointments where God just was leading and directing. And I had to be obedient at the time when God said to speak. Would you be obedient when God tells you to speak? Jot down Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. Ask the Lord for that boldness to be able to speak the word Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, and he can help you with that. There's one other time when we were traveling and we had a leaf spring break. It was on Easter weekend. It was late at night, about 11 o'clock at night, midnight or so. We had another hour or so to get in before we got to our destination. I stopped at a truck stop and I smelled some burning rubber. I looked, the tires were rubbing together. Could, could have caused a fire. And, and I saw that the suspension was off. And I pulled off in the truck stop and couldn't get anybody to help us, of course, that night. We had to wait till the morning. And, 
And the only place that was available was Jerry's Auto Service. I said, okay, I'm calling Jerry. And, uh, and so Jerry gets there and, uh, and said, hey, uh, here's what the problem is. It's over here and over here. And, and can you see if uh, you can track down the parts? He goes, yep, I think I can do it. And uh, so <laughs> he's real slow. And, and uh, uh, I said, okay, well, do you, you, you know what to get? Yep, I know exactly what to get. Next, I see him going in the truck stop. <laughs> Sipping his coffee. I said, hey, Jerry, we're going to go get those parts? Not yet. After coffee. That's okay. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, let's hurry. And uh, so finally he leaves. He said, it'll be a couple hours. And I said, yeah, just to get going. <laughs> it's going to be a couple hours. And uh, I'm thinking, well, Lord, maybe I'm here so Jerry could be saved. So I start praying that way. God, help me to witness to him. Lord, not only help me to witness, help him to receive the witness. Or just guide the conversation. Lord, and I started to pray really in faith. I said, God, save Jerry. Lord, I, I believe you can do that. And I, this was I just like, I'm not just casually praying. I'm, I'm praying, Lord, would you specifically help me to, to say what I need to say, help him to listen, and I pray you'd save Jerry today. Well, <clears throat> a couple hours went by, and I heard a knock on the trailer door and open the door. I said, hey. Uh, can I help you? He said, yeah, I'm here with your parts. I said, where's Jerry? Oh, he had to go to another job, and, uh, but I'm going to put on your parts. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I, was, I was praying for Jerry to be saved, you know, and I was a little disappointed. I said, okay, so I'll, I'll just get started. I said, okay, no problem. So we waited, and so he's finally finishing up the job, and he said, are you paid with credit card? I said, yeah, we have to go back to the shop. You want to ride with me? I said, sure. And so I, I started getting conversation with him and started asking about his salvation in heaven. And he didn't know anything about it. He said, well, I've been wondering about that, and I don't know if what's going to happen when I die. And I said, well, you know, the Bible says you can know for sure you're going to heaven, and here's how. And, and I started going through the gospel. We got to the shop, and we're continuing to go through the gospel. And I We'd make the transaction, and then we'd have the drive back, and he's asking questions. He's engaged in the conversation, and, and uh, then we get back to the truck stop. We stopped there, and for several minutes, we stopped in his parked truck, and he's, we're going through the gospel, and I'm showing him right there from Scripture how he can be saved. He says, I said, would you like to do that? He said, yeah, I sure would. And he trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. He said, you know what? I'm going to tell my wife about this. And, and I've got some kids, too. And, and they're getting about the age where they could probably start to understand. I'm going to share it with them. I said, man, that's awesome. I said, what's your name? Oh, well, my name's Jerry Jr. <laughs> Jerry did get saved. <laughs> but it wasn't the one I was thinking about. Look, you don't know what God has in store. <clears throat> but you're never going to find out. If you're disobedient to the Holy Spirit, when he tells you no in the other areas, and then when you get to the opportunity to witness and you tell him no, you're not going to see what God can do in and through your life to be a witness to others. You want to be at the right place at the right time? Would you say, dear God, help me to not say no to the Holy Spirit. Help me not to trust my feelings. And Lord, help me not to miss your divine opportunity by not obeying, not trusting you in these areas and yielding to your spirit. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help right now. Would you please give it? Help us, Lord, to be dependent upon you and, Lord, sensitive to you in your spirit to be able to be guided by you to tell others about the Lord Jesus. Let me ask just...